Well, good afternoon, everybody. So just a second ago, one of my early mentors in my career at the U.S. Department of Education, uh, Mike Smith, just said hello and knock him dead. I haven't seen you in a few years, and it's really an honor to be with all of you here today. I'm just going to take a, a second to tell you a little bit about my background. I, I did start in politics, which I think uh, if you're going to work in school reform and trying to dramatically change opportunities and outcomes for um, urban youth, um, that's a pretty good place to, to cut your teeth and learn some skills because if we're not able to really mobilize people, mobilize resources, uh, change people's minds, attitudes, beliefs, actions, it's phenomenally difficult to get this job done. I did transition from uh, political campaigns uh, to a presidential um, environment on the transition and then had the opportunity and the honor to work for um, the Secretary of Education, um, Dick Riley and Mike Smith at the U.S. Department of Education. And I, I ran the Goals 2000 Community Project, really trying to help communities organize around the national education goals and provide the kinds of supports that would enable students to achieve that. After a few years, to be honest, I did grow frustrated because I felt that the need in the field was so great and so many people, um, as I traveled across the country, were asking for more hands-on support um, to um, help principals reconceptualize schools, uh, to retrain teachers, and really restructure the way that we're able to uh, enable students to succeed. And I just felt the limitations in the, the structure and the bureaucracy that I was in. I had an opportunity to go to work at New American Schools, which was created by a group of business leaders, and some of you may have been part of this movement, around the creation of these break the mold school designs and the idea of taking these innovations, testing them, putting venture capital behind it, seeing what work the Rand Corporation helped to identify the most promising programs, and then eventually taking it from about 100 schools, pilot schools, um, to a national movement, about 10,000 schools, and a federal program called Comprehensive School Reform. And a lot of people felt pretty good about that and felt that they had made a difference and they had created a movement. Um, but I have to be honest, um, after a number of years, and I was with that organization for 11 years, I served as its president for the last six, as you started to look back and you said and asked yourself tough questions, um, have we fundamentally changed outcomes for kids? Uh, for the most at-risk kids. In too many cases, uh, the, the truth would be we experience phenomenal incremental test score gains. And a lot of people, a lot of superintendents, mayors, other individuals took credit for that. But when you went back and looked to see who actually went to and graduated from a post-secondary institution, I mean, did you succeed in fundamentally ending the cycle of poverty? Uh, unfortunately, the answer was too often no. And that was depressing, to say the least. What New American Schools did was really look at this issue of how do you generate innovation? How do you take it to scale? They got at this issue of scale, but they didn't really get the design component right. At that point, I had the opportunity to um, become part of Say Yes to Education. And what struck me about Say Yes is, first of all, they really did understand that the barriers that were faced by most young people living in poverty were not just academic. There were a set of social and health and financial barriers and cultural barriers and expectation barriers that were also holding back kids. And Say Yes to Education said we have to address that by developing and delivering programs that would help to eliminate um, or more realistically minimize those barriers. And Say Yes to Education has been doing this for 25 years. I came on board 18 years into the journey. Um, you talk about doing a prototype work, actually implementing, refining, continuously improving, testing again, looking at the difference if you start with kids in seventh grade versus fifth grade versus third grade versus kindergarten, and doing this over an extended period of time uh, with an angel donor. His name is George Weiss. Um, he happens to be a billionaire, cares very much about kids, grew up in poverty, and he had patience that patient capital to really sort this out. At the point in time that I came on board, it was around, how do you rethink this? How do you create a design? In the first 18 years, we impacted about 1,000 kids. That's an amazing for an individual to do that. But the need in this country, obviously, is much, much larger than that. 
And that was the question uh, that I was asked to take on and to begin to think about. So we moved from this proof of concept piece to focusing on how do you design a program that can take these elements and deliver them not for a cohort of 400 students in Harlem, but for 20,000 students in Syracuse, New York, or for 35,000 students in Buffalo, New York. And this is a process and a journey that we're on right now. The opportunity, just to link to this morning, when you do have an innovation that's been able to increase both high school and college completion rates, so that in most of the cohorts, you started to see the outcomes that mirrored what was happening in, sub in suburban communities, completing not only high school, but post-secondary degrees, you start to create the conditions where you're growing a new middle class. And in this nation, and we happen to be based in, in New York State, and there had been a lot of work around looking at the issues of poverty and what kinds of programs and how much that would cost. There was a fiscal equity case that ran for 20 years, a decision to invest more and to recognize that you had to address not only academic but social and health needs of students and families. We we're also experiencing economic decline, particularly in upstate New York, cities all across that throughway spiraling. You're seeing um, steady erosion of a tax base. You're seeing increases in crime, increases in dependency. You're seeing uh, many corporations begin to move out of those cities. You're really starting to see the inability to meet the needs and service a city of 250,000 people. You saw the academic achievement gains go down year over year. You saw most of the middle class move out of the cities. So you had real concentrated levels of poverty. So a real need and uh, a real openness, potentially, to consider doing business in fundamentally new and different ways. The question we had to ask ourselves as we began to move forward, we had a sense of what the formula was. And I'll talk about the elements of that in just a second. But if we're going to deliver it at citywide scale, we had to be able to inspire the power structure that exists, county government, city government, the school district itself, the local philanthropic sector, corporate philanthropy, that were all working in their individual silos. Nobody was working together. Nobody had a common plan. There was no synergy. There was phenomenal inefficiency. We really had to say, how can we rethink this? How can we get on the same page? How can we map and align investment, strategic investment, to be able to get the kinds of outcomes that we have been able to see in Philadelphia, New York, in Cambridge, in Harlem, and in Hartford, Connecticut. And really what we started to see, and that I'd like you to consider today as you're doing your work, is that maybe sometimes design isn't just about an innovative new, new thing. Maybe we really do have to think about design and innovation and how we create the kinds of structures within cities, within communities, within regions, to be able to effectively allow those innovations to get plugged in and to really be taken to scale. As you start to look at the work out in the field, the other thing you notice is oftentimes government programming, whether it's the federal, the state, the local, that it is well-intentioned. There are a lot of great people, smart people, working hard, developing concepts and, and ideas but often imposing them, mandates and regulations, rather than creating the conditions or the incentives or the inspiration or the linking mechanisms to enable people at the local level to really sort out what's needed and work together to make that happen. So rather than the imposition of these kind of top-down activities, we were trying to think through how can we get public and private agencies to work together and actually work based on research. Part of what we talked about was we have to begin to change the questions. Uh, there's a lot of conversation in terms of, you know, how much money do we need? And when we got into the communities, we realized nobody was really asking the question about what money do we currently have and are we using it in the most effective ways? And you also see a certain level of dysfunction in communities around people just fighting. You know, a, a, a perception of a zero-sum game, and everybody's got to get their piece, whether it's community-based organization, it's a school, 
it's other actors at that local level, which isn't really that productive. We need to be focusing on what are the actual programs that are going to dramatically change outcomes for kids, families, and communities, and how do we map and align the resources to get to, get to that outcome. I'm not going to walk you through all of this, but one thing that we knew was incredibly important to design was having a shared roadmap that everybody plugged into. Part of what we did was to ask that question, do you as a city, do you, are you willing to commit to a bold idea of post-secondary completion for every single child? We know we're living in a time where every child does need access to that kind of educational opportunity and, um, and they have to be able to, to learn at that level to productively participate, but what will the community come together? What we did was bring to the community a scholarship incentive, and we've created the capacity in the city of Syracuse and the city of Buffalo that every child that goes through public education, that completes high school and gets admitted to a college, we support a full tuition scholarship. That's a pretty big idea. But for that to be delivered in perpetuity for the long haul, we created a set of non-negotiables which are incredibly important. So the first was the commitment to that outcome objective. The second was really to create a pathway or a pipeline that brought early education together with K-12, together with higher education. Uh, we had to um, have commitments around transparent accountability and also transparent management of resources within the community with a third party objective set of reviewers to audit and report out on that on an annual basis. And really the big game changer was the commitment to a collaborative governance structure that said we, we need to move away from silos. We can't have county government working side by side with city, with a school district and with the private sector, everybody doing their own thing. People had to give up part of their positional power and had to come to the table regularly to plan, implement programs, align funding, and eventually be able to deliver the types of programs within the public schools that would lead to um, outcomes in student achievement as well as citywide economic development outcomes. The piece about what makes the difference for kids, when you set that bar as post-secondary completion and you provide the scholarship, it's amazing how much the conversation changes overnight. But it won't be enough. You have to be able to put in place a set of academic, social, and health supports which will enable students to get to that goal. And so that's what we're doing together with people there. One piece of the, de the design that I think is relevant probably to most people in the room is that if you're trying to work within a community and you're trying to work cross government and we're probably not going to be able to reinvent government so it all becomes one integrated seamless system, um, I think we've seen a lot of efforts at that that don't ultimately end up being productive. Our solution is one of looking at collective impact and creating a new infrastructure of facilitators that actually serve as the glue to bring together county social and health services together with school-based academic services, with community-based extended day, extended year services, tutors and mentors, pro bono legal clinics, family counseling supports provided just in time when needed and site facilitators placed into every public school building that don't work for any of those institutions. They work for an honest broker that helps bring together and drive the synergy is what we have found has been a real game changer within the communities we're working in. Another part of the design, it's, it's really important to have data management systems that help keep everybody on the same page, that actually track the metrics that matter. Uh, we've worked with the American Institutes for Research. We've created 13 core metrics. Some are academic, some are social, some are health. What's important is you're able, to, you're able to really look at each individual student, progress over time, and importantly, to coordinate the types of support services that have been proven to effectively enable kids to graduate from college uh, or vocational training programs over time. This kind of student monitoring system is very replicable. Take it to scale. Uh, we now have it in two full cities. In addition, you have to actually help to put together a new way to work together as a community. And I'll be perfectly honest, when we started this work, we went out in New York State, we had a competition. 
We said, we're going to create the capacity to offer these scholarships to every child in your community. You have to agree to these non-negotiables. And one of them was really around this collaborative governance. We got into the city, started working together, and realized we hadn't designed the system for collaborative governance. We simply had not thought that piece through. How do you get people to work cross silos? How do you get people to walk away from their positional power? And how do you get them to strategically map and align resources to get the set of research-based programs to scale and to actually have it be funded through reliable funding streams rather than these short-term grants, which is what happens in pockets across this country. So we designed this type of local infrastructure where you could pull people together in a community leadership council co-chaired by a county executive, a mayor, a school board president, the head of a major higher ed institution, the head of a major corporation, 60 people meet quarterly, an operating group that literally meets every two weeks, every two weeks, where you have key folks, the superintendent, the head of the teachers union, business leaders, social service leaders, the county, the city, planning and implementing, and again, giving up positional power. It brings all of these forces together and allows you to drive this. How were we able to offer scholarships? Another design challenge. We had to do two things, create local endowments within the cities themselves to fund the cost of, of public education, a last dollar scholarship. It's about $1,200 per student on average. You can build that endowment. And the second was to get private institutions to stand with us. And we've been able to recruit 100 colleges to date, and we're just at the front end of this. Some quick lessons. The first piece of it, and I will just reflect for a second on the difference between new American schools and say yes to education. We had no compelling incentive that when grant dollars ran out would force people to continue to do the right thing. So in new American schools, when grant dollars ran out or comprehensive school reform grants ended, it didn't naturally get brought forward. In the city of Syracuse, where we hit a huge, huge pothole with the bottom falling out from the economy starting in 2008, we actually got county government, city government, everybody to stay at the table because of the scholarships. They found the most innovative, creative ways to be able to identify the $3,200 per students that were needed because they did not want this asset to be taken away from their community. So if you think strategically about incentives, you can weather the inevitable storms. You do need a playbook. Anybody that's interested in seeing our playbook, we do have a guidebook for citywide turnaround. And Jean Maroff, a New York Times reporter, has actually just written a four-year review of the process of creating this community mobilization strategy and this initiative in Syracuse, New York. And it's actually a pretty good read. You have to marry school improvement with economic development. That's how we were able to get the state government and the federal government to begin to come behind the work we're doing, because we really have been able to prove when you invest in kids early, often, and throughout the continuum, you end up decreasing the cost of government over time. And we're doing the economic development studies. We've got the American Institutes for Research. We are going to drive home with our outcomes over time how you do this. This investment in a new civic infrastructure we all have a lot of work to do, but our goal is by creating this kind of infrastructure in cities across America, the great work that you're doing, when you're ready, you've proven it, and you're ready to go into a community, that each one of you doesn't have to go through this ridiculous process to get what works to scale, that this kind of infrastructure makes it easy to plug in and move forward. I just want to give you some sense that results can happen. We took 20 years to really prototype and refine, and we've only taken now four and a half years to begin to take to citywide scale. You can see the results. Graduation rates improving, matriculation rates improving, crime going down, home values going up. We're beginning to see movement in, in the actual academic achievement area that takes the longest to get that done. Huge reductions in foster care placement, huge reductions in reports of neglect and abuse. When you come together as a community, you can make incredible things happen. 
I asked you just to look at the literature around this idea of a shareable city. That's what's happening in Syracuse and Buffalo. Knowledge Works Foundation has put out some important elements there. And I just want to leave you. One of the things that we at Say yes to Education say is we need to stop settling for less. We need to stop settling for less than what kids are really capable of doing. We need to stop settling as communities for less than what our community is capable of doing. And what we found is when we don't settle, college is, really does become a reality for thousands of students already. And when communities commit to work together in very different ways, you actually can rebuild communities. You can revive these post-industrial cities starting in New York State, and we look forward to going across the country. It's been a journey. We, we really would love to have connections to more of you in the room and would love to help you in your design challenges when you think about how to actually take it to the community and take it to scale and get sustainable funding. Thank you so much.